All right, well, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Sarah uh, and I'm going to be your host today. Um, we're really excited to dive into today's session, Cloud's Future Runs Through Sovereign DBAS. Um, we have a lot of great information to share with you, uh, but before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, all attendees will remain muted throughout the duration of the session, um, but we highly encourage you to ask questions and you can do so through the chat feature located on the Zoom control panel. Um, we will be reserving time at the end for those, so please submit your questions and we will be sure to answer those at the end of our session today. Um, additionally, a copy of the webinar recording will be made available to all those in attendance today as well. Um, so without further ado, I would like to present today's um, speakers. So first we have Sanjeev Mohan. Sanjeev is an established thought leader in the areas of cloud, big data, and analytics. He researches and advises on changing trends and technologies in the modern cloud data architectures. He started his data and analytics journey at Oracle, where he worked on emerging technologies. Until recently, he was a Gartner vice president known for his prolific and detailed research and for directing the data and analytics agenda. Now a principal at Sanjmo, he provides advisory and consulting services covering modern data architectures, governance, and operations. He regularly presents on topics pertaining to end-to-end -to -end data pipelines and is excited to help businesses discover what their data can do for them. And we also have with us Vinay Jusery. Vinay is the CEO and co-founder of Several Nines. Vinay is a passionate advocate and builder of concepts and business around distributed database systems. Prior to co-founding Several Nines, Vinay held the post of VP EMEA at Pentaho Corporation, the open source BI leader. He has also held senior management roles at MySQL, Sun Microsystems, Oracle, where he headed the global MySQL telecoms unit and built the business around MySQL's high availability, high availability and clustering product lines. Um, prior to that, Vinay served as director of sales and marketing at Ericsson Alzado, an Ericsson-owned venture focused on large-scale real-time databases. So with, um, with that, I will now hand it over to you, Sanjeev. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be on this webinar. This is a very different kind of webinar. I, I do a lot of uh, research and talks on data management system, data governance, data security, privacy, and uh, some of those topics. This is, this is unique because this is where uh, some of the data security, data privacy, and data management products or, or concepts, they actually collide. And they collide in the cloud where we are providing database uh, as data as a service, database as a service. So today's agenda is, uh, is that I will first talk about uh, what is happening in the cloud space when it comes to data and analytics. Why sovereign DBAS? So what is sovereign DBAS that we are introducing today? What would constitute a sovereign DBAS, i.e. the key characteristics? And then I'll hand it over to Vinay so he can talk about a several lines approach to doing sovereign DBAS. So with that, uh, let me talk to you about what is today's state of cloud usage. This is a report uh, from a company called Flexara and Flexara uh, bought a company called RightScale, which has been doing surveys on the adoption of cloud for many, many years. And in that process, the, uh, it's, it's actually quite fascinating to compare their reports over years and years of, uh, of this work. And you see that uh, there are certain trends that are very interesting. On one hand, there is a stampede for people to move to the cloud. And when they say move to the cloud, a lot of times we're thinking about public cloud. But what we are starting to see is that simply going to public cloud usage actually is going down. And private cloud usage, just like a year ago, uh, the private cloud usage was 80%. And in the latest report from 2022, it's, it's already up to 84%. In other words, what's happening is that organizations are moving to the cloud, no doubt about that. And that is the right thing to do. But 
there is a recognition that we need to understand our workload characteristics and move to the cloud in a more intelligent fashion. Why would we do that is because because there is no single solution that's that's a panacea to all our problems every solution we pick will have its trade-offs and these trade-offs mean that we have to understand both you know uh, like all the alternatives such as the challenges include security there are certain workloads there's this certain kind of data that some organizations either are obligated to not move to the cloud or move to the cloud with very, very high security. They're just, you know, sensitive data, compliance, regulatory uh, kind of data. The second thing is uh, another challenge is expertise. We see the cloud space is disaggregating or unbundling or decoupling at a faster rate than any time in the past. Best of breed solutions are coming up to do micro segmentation of the stack. So that means we need more and more expertise. And the, the final thing that we are also starting to see is why there is so much scrutiny on public cloud. Like I said, you know, when public cloud came in, there was a stampede, but now people are, are, are saying, no, 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 let's just think through these three aspects of security expertise and spend it's because cloud spend can get out of hand very quickly because it is so easy to onboard it is so easy to to get on the cloud and start running your workloads that the the flip side of that is that you can end up paying uh, a lot so finops as a result has been a very big issue in the cloud so here is a, a list of all the cloud challenges. Now, the exciting part today is we want to talk about sovereign DBAS. So I'm not going to go through this, but you'll have a copy of the slide deck if you want to see what are the top cloud challenges. So let's look at how we are intelligently deploying our workloads. I have this graph here. Uh, I have on, on X axis, uh, I've got workload usage frequency. How often am I deploying or using my workload? And then, sorry, on Y axis and on X axis, I have workload execution duration. How, how long do these workloads run? Public clouds are fantastic when it comes to elastic workloads. In fact, one of the, the biggest promises of cloud is I pay for usage i pay for the time i use the resource and then i stop paying that means my my uh, workload needs to be elastic for example let's say you know i want to train a model uh, and determine uh, or predict customer churn so for that i have decades of data and i want to bring thousand CPUs or GPUs, and I want to run a, a probabilistic uh, machine learning model on it. But then once I've trained it, then I don't need those resources perfect for public cloud. But if I am running a workload more frequently and for longer duration, then I may want to look at a co-location facility. But if I'm running it like constantly, and I am not taking advantage of the, the slow times when I can start saving money, then you know, there is a possibility that on-premises may be a more cost-effective way for me to run my workloads. So this is how we should be thinking about our deployment models. So this takes us to this concept of sovereign DBAS. So what is sovereign DBAS? So I have a definition, sovereign DBAS, gives you the ultimate portability. You choose where you want to deploy your data without any fear of locking in, i.e., you know, it's you using most likely open source or open standard, open formats, and you as a user have full control over your cost, your security, and how the configuration takes place. So this is this is this is the idea behind sovereign DBAS, and and uh, I am uh, very interested in also listening to several lines as they go deeper into sovereign DBAS. As a technical person, I am more interested in 
understanding what makes a DBAS, a sovereign DBAS. So, so I have uh, six different criteria that I'm looking at. The first one is what I call ownership and location. So the first, uh, uh, the first idea of sovereign DBAS is who owns that data? And uh, as the second is, where is that data kept? When we were we were discussing the sovereign DBAS uh, concept, so we were actually calling it a private DBAS. But then the, the thing with private DBAS is a lot of people when they hear private DBAS, they go, oh, it's on premises. But it's not. The idea is that the data plane is in my control. I own the data plane. And, but my location could be private, public, on-premises, hybrid, multi-cloud. I can choose where I want my data plane to be. So this, this is the, the very first characteristic is I own the, 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 the data plane, and it's, uh, but its location is, uh, is flexible. And I may actually have a situation where uh, I may have multiple locations at the same time. And I, I'm moving data based on, you know, uh, what kind of use case I have. If I need some sort of like ODBC connection and I want to run a report and I, I, I want to use Power BI, then, you know, I may prefer to put it in Azure. But if I'm doing some sort of a data science workload, I may want to put it in, let's say, AWS or GCP or something like that. And then there's a whole control plane because the, one of the important things is that if I'm going to do this distributed kind of environment, then it is extremely important for me to have a single control plane so I can orchestrate and I can see, you know, where is my data, what is the state, the health of where it is deployed. So, so we'll talk more about, about that. The second thing that I also want to to uh, to have a complete handle on is cost management. So that is a second major characteristic or benefit of of sovereign DBAS. One of the the big issues that we've run into with cloud is lack of cloud cost predictability. Uh, it's so easy for for somebody to spin up an instance. Uh, uh, some, you know, a cloud uh, instance, and then just go home for the long weekend and the instance is running and incurring costs. Uh, or to run a, a, a badly written SQL where you are joining, doing a Cartesian join between million row tables and all of a sudden you get a, a, a huge bill. So managing your cost, being able to predict it, using open source preferably, is, is how we are uh, uh, doing better cost management. Manageability, I talked about this, this is a single pane of glass. I see this quite, quite frequently where uh, a, an organization, a client of mine has a DBAS on a cloud provider, the cloud provider decides that they are going to move to a new, uh, to, a, uh, to the new version but everybody in that uh, availability zone needs to get upgraded at the same time. Maybe there is a short uh, lag of a few days, but whether you're in the middle of processing a cycle or whatever it is, you will get upgraded uh, or, or there'll be some patching. Well, sometimes some workloads need more control. And yes, there are many ways of addressing this. Long-term support is, is LTS is one of them. But uh, some organizations want better control over how their deployments are managed, which includes high availability, disaster recovery, uh, backups, monitoring and alerting if, they, if there's a problem and configuration management. The next uh, feature is user experience. Having a common user experience, whether the user is a developer or an administrator or a DevOps person and having uh, some automation built in, but a, a, a unified user experience irrespective of which cloud I pick is, is a massive, massive uh, advantage because uh, a lot of times I see why organizations have every product available 
but it's, it's sitting on the shelf is because it's, they're not intuitive or they're different. So it just takes too much effort to be able to, to run those uh, different uh, products and, and have so many different skills. Security, uh, without a doubt, we, we want to make sure that data address, data in motion, and actually also data in memory is now coming up. All of these things are applied in a consistent manner, irrespective of where my data is deployed. The final thing that I want to talk to you about is, sorry, I went in the wrong direction. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk to is, why is it even called sovereign DBAT? It is because one of the drivers, which has become really big these days, is the data residency, the uh, compliances, uh, regulatory requirements, such as the GDPR, uh, these these are the ones that are, are forcing companies into taking another look at how their data is deployed and making sure that uh, that data that originates in a place stays in that place if it is if it has any sensitive or personally uh, identifiable information. So with that, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, a quick SWOT analysis, uh, and then I'll hand it over to Vinay. So, so let's look at why would you do a sovereign DBAS? What are the strengths? First of all, we've talked about all of these things. My costs are predictable. I don't have a cloud vendor lock-in. I am maintaining my data privacy uh, with full control over operational aspects. It is not that I think my data is deployed in region X, but behind the scenes there's a backup copy in region Y, which you know uh, I'm not you know, entitled to, to, be, to have my data in that region. So some very distinct strengths, but there are some weaknesses. Like I said, there you will not find a single solution that solves all your problems. So so what are the weaknesses? First of all, the onus is on you, where you need to have that IT talent. And we know IT talent is in short supply. So that's why you have to be very careful as, as to do your, uh, your requirements outweigh the fact that you will need some in-house talent to manage this, um, uh, th this uh, option. Uh, it's a newer category, which means with every new category, there's a learning experience, there's a learning curve where you know uh, things need to get more defined and more companies come into this place. More, more companies, more competition is a good thing because it, it, it lifts the standards uh, up uh, for everybody. And then also you have more responsibility. So which means, if you are going to have more control over your backup strategy, you might better make sure that you have a, a way to do your recovery testing and keep, keep track of your RTO, RPO, uh, and all of that because it's your responsibility. So, so there are, uh, uh, so buyer beware, know before you go in. But this area is full of opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, it gives, uh, much more optionality. I'm, I'm hearing this word a lot these days, optionality. Uh, and that's what we are, we are giving our customers, optionality of looking at, uh, at different ways of deploying their workloads. Also getting better at a single pane of glass, having, having that single unified view of my data is, is, is uh, something that you know, we talk about quite a, quite a bit. In fact, a lot of people are opposed, they, they just think the single pane of glass uh, just sounds great, but it doesn't exist. So there's, uh, it does exist and uh, you will see when I will talk more about that. So, and then this ability to develop standards and best practices. So there's, there's opportunity in that space. But then there are some threats, like for example, fully managed SaaS and serverless is what a lot of businesses want. Businesses don't want to be sometimes in the business of having to manage the nitty gritty details of their deployment. So, so SaaS and serverless are, are rising fast. 
depends on on your use case if your use case uh, is such that that you can use a serverless option then so be it the second thing is that sovereign dbas is is also a concept that even the hyperscalers acknowledge they may not call it sovereign dbas uh, actually till today this is it's a new uh, term that that uh, several lines has come up with but uh, aws has rds custom rds custom gives you for example root access to the underlying uh, infrastructure which uh, normal rds does not now by giving root access you're opening up you know, you, you're taking on more responsibility, but you're signing up to do that. So, so uh, hyperscalers are jumping into this this place, and then certifications take a long time. So, some like in the U.S., we have uh, U.S. government requires FedRAMP. We have SOC2. We have we talked about GDPR. We have HIPAA. If you are in healthcare, all of these are time-consuming. Uh, re uh, regulations that you know sovereign DBAS vendors will eventually have to get to to get these uh, these kind of clients. With that, I am going to hand it over to to my friend Vinay. Uh, Vinay, please take it over from here. Thank you, Sanjeev. Let's see here. Uh... Yeah, so, so, you know, thank you everybody. Thanks for, you know, thanking you again for joining. So I'm here live in Stockholm. Um, uh, you know, good to see the sort of distributed team in, in, in motion here. So Sovereign DBAS, we have several nines. Before we get there, let's, let's have a look at, you know, how, how, how databases have been managed, right? So before DBAS, uh, organizations used to own their databases, they used to have their data centers, and they used mostly proprietary software, right? Um, and you know the advantages were, 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 were quite clear. They owned the infrastructure, they had all the control, they had all the internal knowledge, right? And I remember about 20 years ago when, when, I, when I started working for MySQL, we would speak with large companies and um, the databases that were using, it was mostly, uh, you know, Oracle, SQL Server, maybe some DB2, there were things like Sybase. It was only a few databases, right? And obviously, if you're, a, you, if you're an IBM customer, you would use some mainframes. So, um, so, so you had internal knowledge, right? There were teams of DBAs who knew how to manage these databases. And also, uh, it's it's the pet uh, sort of you know, versus cattle uh, thing, which is uh, there were a few very large databases, and uh, you had teams to you know to take care of them. Obviously, um, there were disadvantages to that, right? Um, it took it took long time to get databases to get infrastructure, right? Which twenty years on, I mean, today uh, things are moving much faster. So you need a cloud operating model right for your for your uh, you know for your IT right which is which is why these uh, cloud services have have really sort of uh, you know taken up um, and also capex and opex right so uh, owning everything doing everything in house it has a high cost right and you need a lot of people for that and then you can imagine whether you know if you if you've gone from a few databases to maybe 10 plus databases as it is today right because uh, there's all these open source databases that's that's kind of come into the, the mix there how do you get all these experts uh right on you know on staff right um so so that was before the dbas and then came came you know came came the dbas so we see it as free acts right there are three different distinct acts to this uh, you know to this trend right so Act One, that's when the Amazons and the Googles came up with, you know, with, with the managed service. Um, and then after that, we have the database vendors who said, you know, wait here, right? Uh, we have these large hyperscalers making money off our database, right? Uh, turning the database into a service. You know, we, you know, we should do that, right? So, so, so that's what many of the companies did. And then uh, the future, I guess you all can imagine what the future is if you signed up for this webinar, right? And we'll come to that. Um, so hyperscalers, they set the groundwork for DBAS, right? And um, if you think about you know, 10, you know, maybe more than that, right? 15 years ago, 
um, you know, it, you know, Amazon came out with RDS, um, and then you know Google came with their cloud service. It was it was very very uh, it was a very interesting concept. Uh, you could get VMs in the cloud. You could click and get a database in the cloud. It was managed, right? Backups, everything was taken care of. Failover was taken care of, right? So it was um, it had many advantages and convenience is you know that was probably the massive change, right? Suddenly, this army of developers out there they had a very easy way to actually uh, you know get access to this infrastructure at the click of a button, right? And when you start at that small scale, it was inexpensive, right? That that was that was the sort of uh, you know uh, you needed a quick database, you know, um, for a project. Click, click. You got a database, and and it was not expensive. Um, the disadvantage is as you move more and more of your workload into that um, into that uh, you know sort of environment, there would be cloud vendor lock in, right? So obviously, if you're using a lot of these services from just one hyperscaler. And you want to go somewhere else? Well, suddenly you don't have access to these services, right? Um, the other thing is um, the actual nomenclature, which which actually Sanjeev mentioned, uh, you know, earlier. Um, each of these different services from these different vendors, they have different um, models. They use different terminology. They have different nomenclature, right? So it can be quite tricky if you want to actually. Have acts, you know, if you want to understand all these different environments, what's the difference between, you know, uh, Cloud SQL and, uh, and RDS and Aurora, right? And then if you go to Azure, right, they all they all use different models, right? So 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 you got to know that, and um, and this is a bit of a problem if you're doing hybrid, because if you move it on prem, what do you do then, right? And what many organizations have found out is when you when you go at scale. It starts getting costly. That's that's a that's that's a big problem, right? Uh, how do you control the cost uh, of, of you know of of these uh, of these cloud services? So um, so you know, hyperscalers came up with the database, uh, you know, sort of as a service. And um, if you look at typically you know the three main hyperscalers, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, right? Uh, multiple database on one cloud, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, but but you know one thing to remember is you will not get some of the open source databases from these hyperscalers directly, right? So for example, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, Neo4j, Cockroach, and then you know there's a bunch of others, right? So so um, um, that there has been a change in licensing so that some of these open source databases are more categorized as source available, which means um, you know not 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 all the databases will be available for these right now multiple databases if you look at rds um for example uh, you have mysql postgres mariadb oracle sql server right and that's it so 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 it's not like you can get all these databases through this uh, you know through this service if you look at uh, for example azure right you have postgres mysql redis cassandra mariadb right um and obviously sql server so, so that's also the same thing, right? You, you, you only get a subset of databases directly from the from the hyperscalers, um, which which takes us to uh, Act Two. Uh, so Act Two, uh, that's when the database vendors follow suit, right? So, um, I mean, you know, obviously there are many vendors who've spent a lot of money building these databases, and uh, and. Suddenly, hyperscalers coming in and you know monetizing that—that's that's that's kind of a big big problem, right? Uh, so what we've seen is um, vendors have come up with their own databases, and that has sort of reduced the cloud vendor lock-in to a certain extent, right? Uh, because these services are running typically on you know on the three main hyperscalers, which means you have a choice, right? It's the same nomenclature across three different major clouds. The other thing is the OSS, you know, open source license stability, right? Um, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, for example, take MongoDB. It's, you know, the 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 licensing is is not open source. It's source available, right? Which means uh, a hyperscaler cannot just take it and manage it, right? Um, so, so what it means is having these databases as a service provided by, for example, MongoDB means you have access to these in the cloud, right? Which is, which is something that is, is required in a way, right? 
um, multi-cloud, right? So at least the main hyperscalers, that's, that's the very good thing, right? Um, what we know is that uh, we see usually enterprises having maybe some on-prem systems and they have at least two major clouds that they are, you know, that they are running their workloads on. And, and from that perspective, um, you will be able to run these services across at least the main clouds. Uh, the problem with that is um, the vendor locking. Uh, so database vendor locking, right? So uh, if, if, if you're running a lot of these databases, you are locked to that service. And uh, which means it's quite hard to get out. Um, you need to develop all the automation yourself. And, uh, and uh, if you want to have other databases, then you have to go and look for other, other, um, you know, other cloud services. The other problem is that it's mono environment. Um, so you can only go into the regions that, that, uh, that are available by these cloud providers. And um, if, if it's on-prem, then it's a, bit, it's a bit hard, right? You, 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 know, you cannot run these, uh, these public DBAS services from a cloud vendor, uh, from, a, from, a, from a database vendor on-prem. And um, it is costly at scale. Um, so the more, the more you use, right, there is a pretty hefty price tag on that. And finally, there is the database control, right? Infrastructure control. As we've seen, um, Amazon has, uh, has seen that and they have, you know, they would allow you now root access to, you know, to, to the RDS custom uh, uh, you know, databases, but, but that's, that's kind of the hard one when it comes to these uh, you know, services provided by the database vendors. And if we look at these database vendors, so one database on any cloud, what does any cloud mean really? Um, well, typically it means AWS, Azure, and GCP. So as example, uh, Elastic um, on their website, right? It will say across any cloud, any cloud means AWS, Google, Azure, and um, MongoDB. You know, it's the same thing. You can run these. Day, you know, these. You can run on any cloud, right? You can run anywhere, as long as it's AWS, Azure, and the Google Cloud, right? So, so from that perspective, you get a choice. But still, you know, I would, I would not expect the whole infrastructure world to be just AWS, Azure, and Google, right? There's much, much more, you know, apart from that, right? So, so. So from that perspective, um, it hits the sort of the. If we look at the enterprise IT reality, um, you know, it's it's it doesn't go together, right? Because uh, for, in one perspective, you have you have these database as a service, uh, you know, options, um, but then you have, you know, the enterprises they are looking for it. You know, typically they run polyglot database environments, right? They probably have five, six, seven, eight databases running. They are running both on-prem and public clouds, right? So all these factors together, that's the reality. And, uh, and what we see is that it is not met by the, by the current uh, you know, line, you know, sort of EBAS landscape. And this, um, this is a challenge, right? So, so if we look at the enterprise today, uh, DBAS is going to be used. There's no, there's no doubt about it, right? There is, there is a place for you know, things that are out there, right? So uh, you know, Amazon has great services. You know, MongoDB Atlas has has uh, you know has great services, right? And, you know, Elastic has great services. So so there is a need for that, but but the actual enterprise cannot just take these point solutions, right? So so what they're asking really is a single pane of glass for hundreds or even thousands of database instances, right? And these should be able to be on-prem or public clouds, right? And not just the hyperscalers, because there are enterprises where they are traditionally working with certain managed providers and they want to be able to deploy on, you know, on these providers' clouds, right? Um, the other thing that people are asking is, you know, the typical databases, Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, Redis, um, and, and, you know, and then you know, at, least, at least a couple of more, right? I mean, if we look at the market today for databases, there are 100 plus or maybe even more than that, right? Um, very commonly used open source databases. Um, Cross-platform provisioning and management, right? With all these databases, you know, you can't really have snowflakes, right? Everything has to be, uh, in a way, you know, it's 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 really like cattle, right? You can have pets. You you know, you need to treat these as cattle. Uh, with all these databases that uh, that are being deployed, and how can you make it easy to deploy a database 
whether it's you know uh, it's on prem whether it's on openstack whether it's on uh, you know it's it's up in the cloud on you know let's say on azure right uh, sanjeev mentioned optionality right uh, so so how do you make sure that these databases can be provisioned and managed anywhere really uh, service concepts and nomenclature right eventually some team will have to manage that and uh, having like a unified model right to manage all that is is good replication of data between environments so like today at the, you know mongodb um, you know announced that you can replicate your data between between the public service and and the mongodb on prem right that you can that you can purchase this of mongodb enterprise right so so what we see is that um, you need to get data between different environments so replication is 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 important and obviously existing deployments right so it's not like these enterprises they have 500 databases they won't forklift all of them and just put them into into some dbas right you need to be able to manage uh, existing uh, you know deployments because there are hundreds and thousands of them so um, so that takes us to act free right intelligent platforms allow organization to roll their own dbas right and uh, what we see with act free is this is this is a sort of you know sovereign sovereign dbas that uh, uh, you know, concept that that Sanjeev you know went through. It has all the advantages of Act One and Act Two, right? Uh, because it gives you deployment speed. You have access to open source databases, etc. Right? But also, you can actually run on-prem in public cloud in a hybrid setup. Right? You can pretty much run anywhere you want. Right? And um, and you know, the cost predictability. Right? Uh, there are studies that have been done. So, you know, there, there is an asterisk here that actually points to a link to, to one of the blogs by, by um, uh, you know, Andreessen Horowitz. You know, well, you can see it in the, uh, you know, it's in the notes, but, um, um, uh, you know, studies show that you can actually run these on-prem, uh, you know, services at half of the cost, right, or less, right? So, so, so environment freedom and also the cost control, right? Database control, right? Database automation without seeding control. That's that's you know obviously if you're running it across your your environments, you will have a team to actually run that 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 you know that DBAS platform. And the other you know the final aspect is OSS licenses, right? They they allow for self implementation. So for example, you're allowed to run MongoDB in that environment, right? Elastic and uh, you know and others, right? So so from that perspective um you are running these services for yourself right so looking at um, act three what we have seen is um a lot of organizations have started looking into building their own DBS, right and um and that's you know obviously uh, that you know apart from the options we looked at hyperscalers and then those you know database vendors coming up with their with their own services there hasn't been a lot of other options, right? So we have seen, you know, um, enterprises building their own. And this is kind of, you know, um, there is a picture of an iceberg here because this is a huge undertaking, right? Building like an automated DBAS platform, uh, you know, trying to hire people like a platform team, keeping up with all these new versions of databases and everything that's going on, right? So, so what we see here is DBAS itself, what it is, well, you know, typically you want to do self-service, you want to offer self-service to your lines of businesses, right? So they want to be able, you know, uh, those people need, need to be able to do provisioning, they want to be able to monitor performance and queries, right? Um, a, and from, from the sort of backend perspective, right, your DBAS needs to be able to do, you know, automated backups, automated restores, uh, you know, performance tuning, uh, you know, troubleshooting, uh, you know, sort of failover, upgrades, right? Uh, reporting, security. There's, there's, there's a huge list of things that need to be automated. And um, if you look at that, then further down, you, you, you know, what we see people doing is they actually go out and find tools, right? For example, you would go and look for a failover tool for Postgres. You would go and look for a, you know, maybe for an open source failover tool for MySQL, for MariaDB. And then you'll try to put that together. You'll, you know, you'll probably take some uh, something like Grafana and and uh, you know uh, sort of Prometheus, 
and uh, try to, to do some kind of, uh, you know, uh, collection of metrics across all these instances, and then try to you know, do your own dashboards. And then, you know, finally, you got to go and hire, right, DevOps people, uh, cloud subject matter experts, DBAs, SREs, cloud architects, right? So it is a big undertaking. And, and you know, at the end of the day, this, this, this will be commoditized, right, this type of software. Like, you know, why, why would you build your own Kubernetes infrastructure when you can actually purchase, you know, a platform for that, right? And, you know, similarly, right? So, so, so um, it is a big iceberg. And um, uh, what, what, what we are offering at several nines, right? Um, well, we have a unified database automation platform, right? So several nines, we've been around for about 10 years. And the, the thing that we, you know, we came up with was, was really, um, you know, automate the database, right? Uh, there were a lot of databases out there, but people needed help, you know, to sort of automate them and run them. And this is what we built over 10 years, right? So, so a number of open source databases uh, are, um, uh, you know, are supported, right? From, from MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, uh, SQL Server, even Redis, MongoDB, Timescale. SQL Server, actually, we did not plan, right? It was not in the, in the business plan to, uh, you know, to, to offer SQL Server because we wanted to stay pure with open source, right? But then enterprises said, hey, we are using a lot of SQL Server, right? We use also Oracle, right? Um, so, 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 you know, from that perspective, you know, we, we said it, it does make sense to, to also add SQL Server and then deploy it whenever you want, right? So OpenStack, uh, well, if we look at private private um, infrastructure, you have very large companies running, you know, OpenStack, and then pretty much everywhere, you know, everyone in industry runs runs VMware, and then we have also Nutanix, which is quite common, right? Um, or you can also deploy, uh, you know, databases on AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, right? Um, and also in hybrid infrastructure. So the idea is one control plane, right, uh, that actually automates the entire lifecycle and giving you things like observability, security, and tuning. Uh, so, so this is going in, into a bit more, you know, uh, let's say these are the 10 major blocks of the platform, right? We won't go into this, but it gives you an idea, uh, right? From, from initial deployment to sort of making sure the databases are monitored, they are backed up, right? Um, there is security, right? There, they are patched um, and, um, you know, if, if it breaks, if a node breaks or if entire clusters go down, that actually they are fixed automatically, right? So, it's, you know, we make sure that the entire life cycle is taken care of. And um, one, you know, one of, them, one of our major successes, right, uh, ABSA, right, formerly Barclays Africa, it's a bank in South Africa and they are in a number of countries. They have a lot of databases, and last year they had they had at least two thousand database servers on a on a sovereign DBAS platform that they built, right? And they built it on, on top of of our software, right? Just to control. So um, um, you know, it's it's um, from a from a sort of infrastructure perspective, they have a number of data centers where they are running VMware and Nutanix. And they are also running on AWS and Azure, right? And uh, basically, it's a it's a hybrid cloud platform that they built. The databases uh, can run anywhere, so there is actually a compliance team that actually, that actually looks at you know where should the data be. If these are customers in a certain country, then they should be placed in the data center in country. Otherwise, they are free to, for example, put them you know on on some cloud somewhere else, right? Um, so 2000, uh, you know, database servers automated and, um, you know, MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, Redis, SQL Server, and MongoDB. These are the different databases that they have. And this, this platform gives them uh, the choice to basically, you know, take in those databases and deploy them anywhere they want, right? And they know it's automated. And finally, we have about 200 customers and counting, right? Um, and, you know, the main thing people come to us for is, is this sort of automation, right? Uh, because, yeah, I mean, you know, I guess everybody here knows something about the, you know, the sort of database industry and, and where databases are going, right? So it's, you, most databases today are not managed by DBAs, right? There's a lot of DevOps people who are sort of 
kind of okay with databases that are managing these databases. And um, our customers, probably 80%, actually, they, you know, they use uh, you know, DevOps folks to manage their DBAs. They don't have full-time DBAs. Actually, the full-time DBA is a, is a you know, it's, a, it's, it's becoming a bit of a rare breed, right? So, 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 so what we see is that, you know, there's an opportunity there, right, to automate as much as possible, right? So that's kind of it. Um, back to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's see. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, if there are additional questions, go on and submit those um, via the Q&A or the chat feature, and we will make sure that we can get to those as well. Um, all right, so first question, um, how is Several Nines DBAS different from Nutanix era? I, I can take that, yeah. So, so um, you know, uh, Nutanix is, is uh, you know, um, it is a sort of cloud platform that you can use for private cloud and also for, for sort of hybrid. Um, a, what the, the main difference is probably that Nutanix needs, you know, um, ERA needs to run on, on the Prism platform, right? So, so everything underneath needs to be Nutanix if you want to run with a DBAS, right? So from that perspective, you know, we are very different because we don't dictate to the, to the customer what type of platform, you know, they need to use. They can use pretty much any, you know, any, any Linux variant, right? And uh, we, we also can manage existing databases that are already deployed, right? Uh, so there's no, there's no sort of migration or uh, upgrades needed. Um, there are a lot of more differences, obviously, but, you know, um, we, can, we, can, we can always share more information later. Back to you. Great. Awesome. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, are we able to run our own DBAS with, for example, Mongo or Elastic? Uh, yes, yes, you are. I mean, we, we talked about the licensing. This, this, is, this has been one of the major, uh, you know, changes probably in the last few years in the, in the sort of database industry where, you know, well, the open source database vendors, some of them, they actually changed their licensing and they actually did not want the major hyperscalers Right to uh, um, to take these and run these as a service because that would compete against their own services that we're coming out with. So, but but you know, uh, so so for example, MongoDB is um, it is available as as the SSPL license, but you you as an enterprise you are allowed to use it and automate it for your own purposes. So from that perspective, yes, we you know there are there are uh, you know we have many customers um, you know automating their own their own DBAS, uh, which has MongoDB. Um, yeah, there's no issue with that. And then when it comes to things like SQL Server and Oracle, then you need to have your own licenses, obviously, to be able to, you know, to run these. Uh, but, 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 but any of the source available databases, it, it's, it is not an issue. Great. All right, so the, um, the idea of data sovereignty has been around for a long time, but um, why is it relevant now? I, I, can, I can take that. So, so I, uh, Vinay actually addressed this, this really well uh, when he said that, you know, we, a lot of uh, uh, workloads moved to the cloud because it was so easy to move. But then as they're scaling up, they're starting to run into some of these roadblocks. Uh, some years ago, actually, it's just a, uh, just four years ago, in in May on May twenty fifth, twenty eighteen, is when GDPR came into enforcement. So we didn't have these strict uh, requirements in the past. In the U.S., there are only four or five states that have some sort of data privacy regulations, but there are literally hundreds of bills currently which are in some sort of legislature uh, being debated. So we are seeing that A, the, the workloads have increased in scope and scale. And secondly, there is more scrutiny coming from the regulatory bodies. So the, this is the reason why sovereign DBAS all of a sudden is, is, has become such a big deal. Uh, Vinay, you like to talk about like Schrems 2, for instance, and some new, uh, you know, like the, the communication breakdown between 
EU, where you are based, and US, where I am, is also causing quite a bit of uh, concern with how our data is exchanged and shared across uh, these two continents. Great. Um, okay, let's see. Um, are you seeing much consumer demand for true multi CSP hybrid database cluster implementations? Uh, we are seeing demand. I mean, uh, I can take that right. Uh, I mean, from from you know, well, one of the one of the things is that you know, uh, this is probably the first time we're doing this type of webinar with sovereign DBAS, right? So, I guess you know, yeah, people haven't really known that uh, you know we we are working on such solutions. Uh, so so uh, you know, we we do automation, and by doing automation, people brought us in saying, hey, we're building this thing here. And actually, most of it is automating databases across any any type of environment. Can you help us? Right. This is kind of what we're waiting for. But but um, um, uh, but yes, uh, I think the the what we see is that some enterprises, like if we look at Absa, they have implemented a cloud operating model, right, for their for their internal infrastructure, right, and they they have been very visionary because they started that like you know three, four years ago, right? Uh, and, and remember last year, they had more than 2000 database instances under management in the platform, right? So, so, um, so they are running it at scale now, right? Um, I, we see companies in different um, stages of implementation um, from some companies having small teams doing proof of concepts some other companies they've maybe done it for, for example, you know, Oracle with you know with with some Oracle tools, and they're looking at how to do it with open source databases, right? And we have companies where they've gone full on and actually you know tried to try to have a pretty large uh, you know sort of undertaking in like a you know, like a platform team with you know architects, uh, you know DBAs, you know automation people, Python, you know sort of you know. All these different, you know, sort of Ansible experts, you know, etc. They actually try to build it themselves, right? So, so we've we've seen. I think it's a little bit kind of early, but but you know, we we do see demand for it, and um, and what we're hoping with this, uh, you know, with this uh, sort of webinar and and you know, things we're going to come out with is to to actually, you know, show to people that hey, that there, there is an easier way to get to this, right? You don't have to build everything yourself. Great. Um, so do you think hyperscalers will ever move into the sovereign DBAS space? Why don't you take this, Sanjeev? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would take this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're starting to to see this. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's challenging for them, uh, I would say, because when you uh, because they, they can move into sovereign DBAS only in their context and uh, which is, the, you know, their data centers. So, for example, if you are in Europe and uh, and you want to be in a local European, uh, you know, cloud service provider, then then you cannot use a hyperscaler because you have like the whole idea is that you know uh, let's say i'm a us based company but i have an offshoot in a small city in germany and there is a local cloud service provider i want my german data to be to be served from that local service provider you cannot do that if you're in a hyperscaler because you can only be in your own data centers. So I, the desire is there because this is such an important thing, but it has to go up a level. Uh, it cannot be only from a hyperscaler. It has to be from, uh, from a, a DBAS vendor that's in all kinds of hyperscalers. Uh, Vinay, I don't know how you feel about this. I think there is a conflict of interest, you know, from the from the sense that you know, if if you're a hyperscaler, you would want, you know, I mean, data has gravity, right? So you would want data to be in your cloud, right? And you you will make it hard for people to you you make it easy for people to get in, and then hard for people to get out, right? This is this is typically what we see, um, and and um, uh, sovereign 
it kind of goes against that data gravity, you know, uh, sort of concept, right? Uh, but who knows? I mean, tomorrow with EU regulation, you could, you know, you could have external regulation that actually says something, and then, and then maybe, maybe it turns that okay, you know, people, people need to need to uh you know need to adapt to this and yeah um, i'm you know aws has this concept of local zones uh local regions you know they're uh now they even have like at iot level uh, wavelength you know so so it's possible you know as andy jesse used to say never say never you know uh, things may change tomorrow uh so that i would say at some point even hyperscalers will try to get into this space Great. All right, we have just a couple more questions. Um, how does several nines service offerings compare to Ivan? Hey, Ivan, yes. Uh, so, so that's great, actually. You know, uh, several nines is based in Sweden and Ivan is based in Finland. And, uh, you know, we are, you know, both countries are very close, right? Um, and, and, and there's a good healthy competition also between the companies. Right from the Nokia's against the Ericsson's, etc. So, so you know, but but Ivan is, um, you know, it's a great successful company, right? Um, they provide all their all their services across across the hyperscalers. So Ivan supports a number of databases across, I believe, three different clouds, right? So so um, and they and they do that from a uh, you know from from their own control plane, right? So probably the main difference is that uh, you know. If you're okay to actually uh, deploy across three different, you know, hyperscalers, then probably you can use them. But if you also have your own data centers, uh, or if you have more databases than what they support, right? Then, then probably, yeah, uh, you you probably want to look at the, you know, at the at some other options, right? So what I would say is, you know, probably Ivan is is you know is towards the direction of the sovereign DBAS, but it's not really there because you know. It is a control plane which is managed, and it's it's you know the, the workload is 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 on a couple of different uh, you know sort of cloud providers. Uh, whereas if you want to be able to run everywhere, or even your own existing databases, then you cannot use it. Right? Great. Okay. Last question. Um, I like the concept of sovereign DBAS. Should I buy or should I build? Uh, Sanjeev. Yes, so uh, whenever it comes down to buy versus build, the first right of refusal in my mind should go to to buy, and the reason is because build, especially if it is commodity, will incur technical debt that you have to then maintain. A lot of DBAS, like you know, how do you upgrade, backup, patch? A lot of that is is pretty heavy lifting with no benefit to uh, to your your business you know and this is a perfect example of something that if you can buy it i would recommend that is what you should do if something was adding value to your business like you know it's business logic very very specific to your industry your organization then sure you should build it but sovereign DBAS, in my mind, should be a buy option first before you, you think about building it. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you both so much, Vinay Sanjeev, for presenting um, on this topic for us today. And thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to attend. Um, just a reminder, we will share out the presentation from today with, with all attendees, um, so you should look for that um, in your inboxes sometime um, before the end of the week. Um, I'd also like to mention that we are about to publish a white paper covering a deeper dive into Sovereign DBAS, um, and we will be sure that everyone in attendance today uh, receives um, a link to, to that as well. Um, so if, there's, if there are no closing comments from, from either of you, um, thank you again, everyone, for your time today, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.